A very big welcome to the Really Useful Podcast. I'm Christian Corley, and this is a special edition of the Really Useful Podcast. We're going to uh, bring to you uh, some of our favourite, most useful sections and segments uh, that we've recorded so far in our previous nine editions. Uh, because Christmas is coming, so happy Christmas, happy holidays to you. And we're going to start off with a look at reasons why your PC overheats. Run into trouble because they're too hot. And heat is often caused by dust and reduced airflow, which then causes more heat, which then slows down your computer. And often, if you've got your computer, and we're talking like towers, although we're also talking laptops as well, if you're prone to kind of stuffing your laptop under the sofa or down the side of the sofa or just keeping it in a generally dusty area, uh, you know, heat is bad for computers. It slows things right down. And, you know, there are a number of kind of internal things that you can do. And well, we're not going to go into that because you don't want to do anything like that, do you? What you want is a quick and easy, hello, is a quick and easy method of speeding your computer up if you suspect it's getting hot. And basically, I mean, I think I know what the answer is. Ben, what would you say the answer was to that? Keep it from getting hot. Um, In general, I would say, yeah, try to blow it out with some canned air once in a while to get rid of dust. And, um, you know, don't run super intensive programs all at the same time. If if that's most computers should be able to handle that. But yeah, dust is the biggest thing. I had some friends in this, this is, you just said we weren't going to say this, but I had some friends in college too, where like you, we, they gave us like sleeves to carry our, our computers to and from classes and everything. And sometimes you would put your computer to sleep. Um, but it would get woken up by like a program that was checking for something or like you would bump a button on your mouse or whatever, and it would wake up in your bag. Um, and if you do that and you know, your computer's awake in your bag for an hour and you don't realize that can be really bad too. But yeah, yeah. Any kind of yeah. blocked ventilation is is dangerous. Yeah, definitely. Uh, it, it is dust. It is ventilation. It is those holes on your computer that are getting clogged up with dust. I have seen some absolute sights of um, blocked ventilation, blocked power supply units on the back of computer towers, uh, which obviously isn't ideal either, From not just from a computer power point of view, but also from a general electrical point of view. Uh, and um, certainly powerful vacuum cleaners, and compressed canned air they are vital but also it's not just the computers that you need to keep dust free it's also the the environment the surrounding area um pets as well sadly um creatures that tend to um leave a lot of hair behind sure that they can also be a problem i remember cleaning out a computer that i think my dad had got hold of uh and it was actually the the entire system was clogged with dust and animal hair and you know it would it was shutting itself down after five minutes every time you booted it up and you know this is what happens if you've got a computer that is you know switching itself off is slowing down horrendously do check for dust and perhaps animal hair and try and keep it try definitely vacuum it out with with a good powerful vacuum cleaner uh, like a Dyson or that kind of um, cyclone device. Use the kind of compressed air, as Ben says, uh, but also then move your computer into a different place. Carpets are bad for computers as well. So if you do have it on a carpet or rug, uh, you know, there is a reduced airflow around the machine there. Keeping it too close to walls, again, sure. that's bad. And it's, the same, it's, 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 wow. it's the same thing with um, like game consoles, too. I wrote an article a little bit ago that it was a detailed guide on how to clean out a PS4. It's similar with pretty much anything, yeah. um, you know, it, it, particularly with a game system. It could be with if you have a desktop for a media computer or something. If it's in an enclosed space, you know, if you if you shut the door and it's in a little drawer in your entertainment center, that's going to restrict uh, the flow of air and the heat's going to build up. So that's no good. So if you, if you have a desktop and it's sitting on carpet, you can get little um, like feet to put on the computer to, to raise it up a little bit, especially because most fans blow down for the power yeah. supply. So you don't want to have obviously the fan having zero or very little room to blow out the heat that's coming from the power supply. Yeah, definitely. I, I mean, I personally, I, I, I would um, suggest a, a hard solid flat surface rather than carpet or any other type of fabric. But uh, obviously you're restricted by where you live, but do, 
put your computer in a place where it can get good airflow around it and through it and is dust free or minimal dust around and animal hair free as well and you should find that things tend to speed up that i mean it may be that damage has been done already to the cpu or the motherboard or the hard drives or the memory fingers crossed it hasn't uh they're pretty resilient these days computers so yeah it'll probably shut down before damage is done yeah to protect itself but if you do it over and over or if it gets extreme if you, if you live in a really hot area it could be damaged beyond repair but hopefully it's just if it shuts off let it cool down and then take action absolutely yeah that was uh, me with uh, one of my uh, co-hosts ben stegner uh he's part of a team that also includes in buckley and gavin phillips and we'll all be back in 2019 we're going to move on now to a discussion about how you can create a hd tv antenna from household pass even something as small as a paper clip. We're going to move on to building a DIY HDTV antenna. Now, this is something that I tried uh, myself a few years ago using a great big plank of wood, 2x4, uh, eight metal coat hangers, uh, some uh, screws and washers, and I I was amazed at how good the signal was, basically. Uh, oh, there's two disposable barbecue grills attached to it as well. Uh, I mean, it looks like a complete lash-up, uh, but it works, and that's the thing. Now, I've been looking at this, uh, I've revisited this recently um, to find out. Uh, I knew there were some other ways of doing it, and... I just got hold of one, which I would bring into the shop, but it's just out of reach, so I can't. I just got hold of a real one. It's a very compact little um, box. And I thought to myself, well, you know, this thing I made a while back was wood. This has come out of a factory. This is, like, quite compact. Uh, can it actually get any smaller? So I've looked into this, and it turns out that, yes, it can get smaller. HDTV antenna can get smaller. Um, there's different ways of doing it. it. And, you know, you can ch check the link. Uh, for the details, but we're talking about card and foil and bits of glue, um, then wires and the attachments of the coaxial cable, uh, which uh, is a kind of uh, important aspect of it. But you don't necessarily have to have that because you just run the coaxial cable, um, strip it, and use the internal core and the external bit and attach those to it. But after saying all of that, it turns out that you don't even need to do that because if you are fortunate enough to live in the right areas you can attach a paper clip that has been unwound, unwound into an L shape like that attach that with a short end into the back of your TV and that is all that is needed now it does depend on your range and weather uh, between yourself and the transmitter but that, I mean, that's amazing that yeah. we're at this stage now that that will work yeah, to be able to pick it up with that like tiny little paper clip, it's just like a random piece of scrap sitting around your house. To be able yeah. to pick up a signal from that is really cool and a good option if you don't, you know, you don't you don't want to put an antenna on your roof or you just recently canceled cable or anything like the article talks about. Yeah, I think probably the best way to do, it, although you could put it back straight back in the the TV. I think the, probably the best way to do it is to run an extension up to some elevated point, maybe um, your, your loft space. Sure. Like space, whatever, and then uh, plug it into the end of there. But uh, you know, when um, digital TV first came along, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming it's the same in the US as it was over here. Uh, you know, it was a weaker signal than the uh, the analog signal, so it would be a lot harder. And obviously, you need to convert it, but it would be a lot trickier to get a good, strong signal without quite a large antenna. But now the analog signal's been switched off here in the UK, more, more or less switched off. There's small pockets which are still used, but it's more or less gone. And the digital TV signal is now stronger. Uh, you know, these things work. Yeah, it, it, I want to say it was the same here. Um, I I don't think I, we had an analog TV at that time, so I don't 
I, I remember the transition because I remember like my grandparents and a few other people that were using just a, a standard antenna. I think if you didn't switch over, it would just broadcast a message like you need to do this. But mm. yeah, it's, I mean, it's if you if you have an old TV that you're not using for anything else, it, just a little fun little side project. If nothing else, stick a paper clip in. <laughs> See what happens. Uh, be careful, and obviously make sure you're attaching it to the right place. Right. Yeah. Uh, safety first. Safety first, absolutely. It actually you reminded me of um, the switchover thing. I had uh, a relative who lived in a small cottage, and basically they had a valley right in front of them, a hill behind them, and then at the other side of the valley, a hill. And here in the UK, up until 1982, we only had three terrestrial channels. And okay. because there was no satellite and no cable, we had three channels. Uh, and uh, my uncle could not receive the fourth channel that launched in 1982 because of where they were based. And this, as far as I know, is still the case today. Uh, without uh, satellite TV, they wouldn't be able to re re receive that fourth terrestrial channel, which now streams through on satellites. Uh, whatever. So, uh, landscape is an important part of terrestrial, whether it's digital or analog. Uh, so, you know, it really does depend on how far you are from the antenna and your location, whether or not that paperclip will work. But, the, you know, the other solutions outlined in that article, we have a, a card and foil solution and a fractal antenna, which is basically, I mean, that's foil again, but with a different design and attached to a piece of, uh, sort of flexible, transparent plastic. And, of course, my own, uh, Attempts, uh, which I found online and, uh, I had to go myself the, uh, an the coat hanger antenna, as we call it. Uh, yeah, that's worth doing as well. Um, so please have a look at that link if you're interested in uh, getting yourself a low budget HDTV antenna, antenna, or as I say, if something has happened to your own antenna and you need to get, uh, TV. Uh, let's, uh, move on. I think it's, uh, doesn't matter what time of year it is if you're buying something online it's important to know that what you're going to buy is the genuine article it turns out that reviews on sites such as amazon and others have been manipulated we decided to uh, have a chat about that in a previous really useful podcast and uh, here's uh, what we determined but uh, british shoppers have been deceived by misleading Amazon product reviews, found a study by the British consumer magazine, which uh, is a great uh, publication, which has done sterling work for consumer rights over the past 30 years, if not more, uh, here in the UK. And, you know, the thing about this is it isn't only British customers that have been duped by reviews on Amazon. Um, the, the, they basically purchased five items and wrote reviews for them as instructed, uh, the, 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 the chosen people. Three out of the five <clears throat> purchases were not refunded. In two cases, the reviews were not considered positive enough, um, which gave one of the promoted products, a smartwatch, a two-star review and did not receive a refund of the purchase price. And the Amazon seller told them to rewrite the review because in the case of a free item given to reviews, it is the default to give five-star evaluation. This whole thing is turned into a kind of rackety sort of underground industry around mm -hmm. Amazon uh, and eBay as well, whereby people are given the opportunity joining Facebook groups, um, sort of bidding on reviews and getting free hardware for good reviews. And it skews the results and it makes it appear that a piece of tat is absolutely fantastic. Uh, have you ever been caught out with one of these, Gavin? Well, a fake review on uh, Amazon. Um, I can't think I have not not on Amazon. I definitely have um, on other sites. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I can't think of a specific Amazon example, but you definitely read through them, and you can you can see some of the reviews are just so glowing. Uh, and yeah. I always find it's the ones that actually make specific reference to a, a, a huge range of features that uh, a specific item has and they're very very detailed uh about specific say dimensions or power aspects and this and that and they yeah. um the ones that seem kind of overbearing scripted you might say <laughs> uh always with a five star um 
so yeah you can you can see how it happens you can see how people are easily duped as well because they're there and they're prominent aren't they so yeah i've um started doing this and so far it's been successful for me um i think it's worth sharing and that is uh, when you're looking on amazon look at the item that you're planning to buy and scroll down and have a look at the reviews now you'll find them all listed in categories you're like the five star the four star three star the two star Ignore the fives and the fours and start with the threes. You can just click those and it'll bring up a list of three-star reviews. Click the two, mm. list of two-star reviews, etc. Read these reviews and see if they appear to be realistic. And more importantly, if they've been given a low score for something that appears to be quite trivial. Mm. I find that people that give a solely disappointed by a very small aspect of things uh, or something, then you can be more or less certain that the actual item is pretty good and they've just been hacked off that it doesn't feature, I, I don't know, three SIM card slots. Yeah, yeah, whatever, yeah. You know? I think that's the way to do it. Look for poor reviews that are unnecessarily low as opposed to, you know, inflated, unnecessarily yeah. high scores. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Um, there was another site... Um... I haven't used much, but I have posted one or two reviews into it, uh, which is uh, Fake Spot. I don't know if you ever used that. Um, oh, yes, Fake Spot, of course. Yeah, which is really handy. I've only used it a few times, and it was uh, one of those times where it was an over, overly glowing review, and it came back and it said, you know, this poster has a reputation for posting this exact same sort of review. And then you can see, hold on a minute, this, this single account is posting reviews on however many products and you think well this person's either a multi-millionaire spending mm. their time on amazon uh or someone who's got a different agenda going on so so websites like fake spot and there's a few others around as well but um they're really good at weeding out these fake reviews uh like christian said as well go through them and find find the ones that read realistically uh as well it's tricky i always used to look for the ones with uh grammatical mistakes did you ever do that because it felt like they were a bit more realistic. You yeah. Off if, to that a bit more. If they feel co colloquial language. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's something that just feels real. Something that reads like the way someone will talk. Yeah. Something, something's a bit conversational, yeah. Yeah, a bit more natural. Um... Uh, that was me with Gavin Phillips, one of my uh, UK colleagues on the really useful podcast. Uh, we're going to move on now to a fascinating discussion about building your own desk and we try to uh, be inclusive here this is a discussion uh, a chat between myself and Ian Buckley and we try to feature things such as standard desks as well as standing desks uh, Ian's a big DIY so he's uh, got quite a bit of expertise in this area last time I built a computer desk uh, it's um, it's well and I'm saying build. I didn't really build. Well, I kind of did, but I didn't. Basically, what I did, I had two. I had a desk and a filing cabinet, mm. and a set of drawers, and then I had two kitchen surfaces, and I basically arranged things in the corner of a room, and then put two kitchen surfaces on top of me and in the middle, and I had a computer desk yeah that's and that's exactly what uh various people i know have done they've got a yeah. kitchen surface and a couple of ikea desks and that's and that's uh that's their desk um and it's something that is so widespread <laughs> uh and it's it, it's almost it's almost difficult for me to say hey go and read my article now because yeah if you want to if you really want a cheap desk find a find a decent bit of wood and then something to stand it on if yeah. it has drawers in it all the better um However, there was a few because I, I also have the same deal. I mean, my my desk, um, my my computer desk, is a secondhand IKEA desk I just found on Craigslist. Um, but my working desk, so for when I'm doing DIY and Raspberry Pi stuff, is exactly that. I opted for something a bit higher because I stand when I do soldering work. Sure. So I have two large IKEA drawers with an old uh, shelf on the top of it. Um, and that uh, that works perfectly well for me. However, I will say one thing: it doesn't look particularly nice. Right. And that matters to a lot of people, especially sure. if this is going to be a desk in you know in in the main room of your house. And that's where some of these other designs come in. Um, the 
one of the things that's quite nice about the uh, some of the trestle desks. So for those of you that uh, aren't familiar with the, the word, that's sort of like an A-frame. Um, uh, f more famously these days sold by IKEA, they have an adjustable height A-frame. And two of those obviously are, they're like sawhorses, you know, they're, they're just two things that's freestanding and you can choose what to put on top of it. Uh, since they're made out of wood and they come in a, in a variety of colors and you can choose what you put on top of it, they are sturdy enough to support pretty much anything outside of maybe a stone top. Um, they're movable and they look good enough to be, say, in your living room, you know, sure. um, and uh, th and that goes for a lot of the, uh, you know, a lot of the more nice looking ones. Um, uh, there's been a bit of a craze for a while for these steel pipe um, desks as well, which are put together essentially of old uh, iron piping for plumbing. Right. Um, and uh, uh, the, the, yeah, there's Pinterest pages abound of different designs for them because they're extendable. That's the exact point. Right. It's just pipe fittings, you know? Sure. Um, I mean, I would say if you are looking for, uh, it depends what you are looking for. I will say that because um, the real question when you're talking about DIY computer desks is should should you bother? Yeah. Is it worth it? Are you going to uh, are you going to save yourself? Uh, enough money by putting the time in to build it yourself or should you just go and buy a cheap desk from say Ikea or whatever outlet store you have near you you know um, and uh, what kind of, the other question is what kind of desk do you want I mean yeah the idea of a standing desk a few years ago seemed a bit weird now it's something that almost everyone that works in an office is aware of if not uh, you know uh, seeing around them on a day-to-day -day basis because desks that you stand at for the health benefits um, yeah yeah uh, desks that you can adjust to sit or stand at uh and you if you're going to make those diy then you're going to have to put a lot of work in and you're going to spend a little more money or you could do what the fella uh what was his name the brandon keepers who's a, a fella who's part of uh, github um uh he got two brackets shell two normal shelf brackets and a decent sturdy bit of wood and then made a permanent stand-up desk out of a shelf essentially yeah so that to me i mean if you've got a, a spare bit of wall space that seems like a brilliant that's that's you know i mean he said it was 40 dollars. if you've already got a bit of wood that's less than a tenner yeah, yeah, for a couple definitely. of strong brackets and then you can sit at your desk and especially if you're someone that works on a laptop it's just it's a question of just stand, walking over the room you know yeah um I must admit, I've for, for, for a long time now, I've been uh, I've uh, making a fully DIY uh, electrical, probably counterweight, but still electric uh, stand up, sit down desk has been a, a real thing I've wanted to do. I just haven't found the time. Um, there's some fantastic tutorials out there for them. I, um, you know, we, I mean, we've talked about IKEA a lot uh, on this topic and, right. uh, you know, I've, I've done great things with uh, ikea stuff in the past i've built a lego table with a five pound table mm. and some lego plates and uh, some uh glue mm. um you know, done you know repurpose other bits of um things like spice racks bookshelves and things like that but one of the things i really fancy having but i simply don't have the space for it is uh the the, the motorized adjustable standing desk from ikea yes. that, that yep. big thing it's it's an awesome table mm. uh, basically you could do so much at it with it um like diy baking uh crafting all the, all the yep. stuff like that it just seems like so many possibilities but it's so bloody big to get in my little house yeah which is, i think uh, that's yeah. the uh, that's the main thing uh and, and it stands to reason really especially if you're buying a commercial product is that if uh, for the really big standing desks for them to put um uh, the, the real thing uh, here um, for, for those that uh, aren't familiar with the idea, a standing desk is essentially uh, two actuators. That's what that's the moving parts in a standing desk. And actuators are basically motors on sticks that can take a bit of weight. That's yeah. what they are. Um, if you're going to make a big standing desk, you're going to have to put some big actuators in it. Um, uh, and actuators are not the cheapest things in the world, which is why most of the standing desks you see, which are smaller, are not designed to take much weight. Uh, and to get one that does take a bit more weight, you're going to spend so much more on the actuators you might as well sell a bigger desk because not that many people are going to be willing to spend up to a grand on a tiny little desk you see what i mean sure. um uh, you can do this yourself you can buy actuators um online and in fact the cost of them has dropped quite a lot i was surprised it's been a while since i looked at them and I, uh, and again one of the options in the list 
the article that I wrote um, is for someone that made it themselves. And I was pleasantly surprised. Um, you want having written the article and as, as a lover of DIY, if you want my honest opinion, if you really want a stand up sit down desk and you don't want a long period of testing and working it out, save up, make sure you've got the space and buy an electric stand up desk. Mm. Um, because if you're willing to put that level of commitment into the space it needs and the money it costs, you'll probably get the best use out of it. Sure. So really anything can be used as a computer desk, can't it? Oh, yeah. Well, uh, one of the things in this article was the uh, the old idea, and it's a, a wonderful old story, that when Amazon was starting up, they couldn't afford desks, so they used doors. Sure. Yeah. And uh, they stuck uh, feet on it. Um, I, I, I have to admit that the the idea of that does sound very romantic, doesn't it? Um, it does. <laughs> back I think in the day. It, yeah, it depends on what sort of door it is, though, I suppose, as well. And well, be, that's... A door we, would be more practical than maybe a bathroom door. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, you, you really don't want one of those, you know, one of those doors with all the dimpled bits of glass in it that you, you saw. Or all, the, or, all the, or all the sunken panels. And, exactly. Yeah. And, and beyond that, even if you uh, even if you do have a completely smooth door, um, most internal doors of houses are made of a couple of thin bits of wood uh, with a, a essentially air in between. They don't yeah. need to be strong. And you don't want to be sticking a heavy computer monitor on one of those. No. Um, which is so as much as the uh, uh, nice romantic idea of the Amazon um, uh, door desks is, you know, it's very nice to think, oh, when Amazon was starting out, they were a small company, they were saving money. Really, to get a solid door and to put legs on it, you're going to, you might as well buy a desk at that buy stage. A desk, yeah. totally, <laughs> or at least yeah. buy a decent piece of wood and four legs and not call it a door, you know. Um, but either way. You can make a, you can absolutely make a computer desk out of anything. Um, and if you uh, spend a very small amount of time, um, just uh, even on YouTube, you'll find there are some fantastic plans for incredibly cheap desks for things you could get at your local Home Depot or B&Q or wherever your nearest uh, uh, hardware shop is. Um, so, yeah, if you want to make, if you want to make a simple desk, get some wood and do it. If you want an electric stand-up sit-down desk, I'd suggest saving up and buying one. Sure. I think that'll give you uh, plenty to think about. We're going to move on to our final favourite tip section segment of the Really Useful Podcast. Uh, just a big thank you to uh, everyone who's followed us and uh, tuned in. We're getting about 200 listens per episode, so that's great stuff. We're going to move on to a final section now about what you should do and what you should keep in mind when buying a new printer. Eight things to check when you're buying a new printer. Uh, the thing about printers, of course, uh, as we discussed on the previous really useful podcast, is that they're ridiculously cheap. And mm. if it goes wrong, if you bought a cheap one, you can just replace it with another cheap one, which will probably cost you about the same as some ink, and you get free ink with it. In fact, yes. there's even an argument for not bothering to buy ink, just buy a new printer and get the ink. What a crazy world, but yes, it's true. <laughs> Yep, it's it's absolutely true, and the, the, uh, it's weird. There's two there's two things I think that p get lost when people are buying printers because they're, they're something that have been so contentious. They're, there's no bigger cliche, and as I mentioned, I think in the last po uh, podcast that we talked when we talked about this, um, there's no bigger cliche than the person swearing at their printer because it isn't working. Yeah. Um. Uh, but the two things that I think get lost. The first is what you said is in the way things are these days. It's almost it almost makes sense to buy a new printer every time, which is a dreadful waste and you know the yep. dreadful for the environment all this kind of stuff but that's that's uh, as a as a good consumer choice that probably makes sense the second thing i think people forget is when they're buying a printer they are buying it for a specific reason it's uh, i know most people that you know uh, uh, they, they're buying a printer because you need a printer in the house but do you really need a printer that can print photo realistically has two points of entry um has a you know a high quality scanner all that kind of stuff on it now, the likelihood is you do want something which is a printer scanner for uh, general use. That's fine. But uh, as I think I mentioned last time, I have a black laser jet printer and it is perfect because the only thing I ever need to print out is pretty much government forms or, it, you know, anything that just needs to be readable. I don't yeah. print photos at home uh, and I don't need to scan very often. When I do, I have a separate flatbed scanner, which I got free with my I think I got free with my iMac 12 years ago. Still works perfectly, you know. Um, that said, there are specific things you should look into. Um, yeah. 
Um, and uh, yeah, I don't know if you if, if you want to uh, if you want to go over a few of those and I uh, can pick yep. up. Yeah. Um, well, first thing to do, obviously, is um, make sure you know how much you've got to spend and stay within that budget. And that goes with anything that you're buying technology wise. Uh, you should also know about the type of ink and how much ink is required. Two ink cartridges, four ink cartridges, ink wells. Um, and there's a budget around the ink as well. Mm. You know, you could be spending twelve pounds on a printer and then find uh, this is an extreme example, and then find that the ink cartridges are like forty, fifty pounds each, and you you don't want to be doing that. Yeah. Well that's that's the beauty of getting an inkwell printer. Um and I think if I ever was to get another colour printer, I would get one just simply because it sidesteps what we were talking about last time, having to get specific ink cartridges that fit your printer. Yeah. If you get an inkwell printer, you buy bottles of ink. And of course, there's an argument that there could be varying qualities of ink. But yeah, you're buying a bottle of ink, you're filling a well uh, within the printer. And um, that, to me, also, they, uh, it, from what I have uh, heard, inkwell printers last a lot longer between changes. Right. OK. Um, yeah. The quality of the print output as well. Um, you know, inkjet is the kind of the cheapest option for printers. And they will start at sort of 600 by 600 dots per inch. Uh, that's yes. the DPI abbreviation that you'll see when buying a printer. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the better, the lower quality of that is, I suppose, um, the better quality the print is going to be on default mode. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Your print speed, um, that is PPM, pages per minute. Uh, you, you might not have a particular requirement for this. You might just want to print out a few forms every now and again. Mm -hmm. Or you might, like me, want to uh, print out scripts and go through them and find the obvious mistakes and scroll over them with a red pen and before you go back and do it again, mm -hmm. uh, which might require you having to output things a bit quicker. Um, you might get five pages per minute. You might get 25, 50 pages per minute. It will also depend on your print quality and what you're printing. Scripts in black will come out quickly. Letters in black will come out quickly. Uh, photos, not so quickly. Mm -hmm. Uh, yep, wireless, that sounds about right. Yeah, wireless connectivity is a big advantage. I, I'd be just, I don't think there's any printer over thirty dollars that you can get that isn't wireless at the moment. Yeah, no. Uh, if if the, I mean, if there is, it would have to be a very very specific use case. Um, yeah, totally. Uh, um, it just, and we're talking desktop that. printers rather than yeah. we're, not, we're not we're not talking like um, receipt printers. We're not talking anything no, like no. that. So, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, you're probably going to get wireless. It might be wireless on Bluetooth as well. Uh, but look for something that will support Apple AirPrint or Google Cloud Print as well uh, mm -hmm. to, to, to get the, the best option for printing. You know, these days you can print from a, from a smartphone, which is, you know, it's crazy, really. Yeah. Uh, um, if you can get something that does more than a printer or if you're looking for something that does more than just print, if you can get something that has a built-in flatbed scanner on top, there's an advantage and a disadvantage from this. If one part of it goes wrong, You've got to get rid of the whole thing yeah. if you're going to get it replaced. Uh, on the other hand, uh, if it will do all in one photocopying, if it's also got a sheet feeder at the top for scanning, that's mm -hmm. good. Most of them will do faxes as well, but uh, after an initial kind of phase out of faxing about 10, 15 years ago for um, these devices, where it was then they're reinstated, it does seem to be slowly going again. Yeah, it's very... Uh... It, it, it's one of those things where it's it's very odd that I, I, I think I've sent three faxes in the last 10 years. Um, and uh, there are still places now and again where there is the option of doing it. But uh, the the general argument, and it is a good argument, which is, you know, you, the, the places where you can fax are almost all updating to the point that you could at very least email um, and save yeah. yourself a print. Um, yeah. And which, again, covers the whole, like, goes back to the point of if you have a scanner, um, and an internet connection, it's very rare that you would have to fax something unless you're dealing with some kind of odd bureaucracy where it has to be that. Yeah, totally. Um, and uh, uh, that, that's the, that's the, the argument. It's, a, it's an interesting argument for the for and against the all-in-one printer scanner kind of thing because, um, as you say, if one part of it goes wrong, then you have to replace the whole thing. And it's almost more of an aesthetic argument because, um, you know, if you are someone that uh, is, is comfortable with the idea of, uh, for example, maybe having using more than one piece of software. So uh, if you have a, a print uh, a scanner that is just a, a normal flatbed scanner, and you can get cheap, high quality flatbed scanners, which um, you know, uh, which are a separate unit, very small. Um, and if you're comfortable enough with the technology to have that set up and have the printer set up, 
then that means if one goes wrong, you can just replace it easily without having to replace a whole unit. But that is taking up two spaces in your cupboard then. Yeah, totally. Or on your desk then. And uh, also, you know, no matter how uh, uh, good the two separate pieces of software you would use, if indeed you used to, um, then yeah, it's not quite as kind of, you know, aesthetically pleasing as something that's all in one. Um, but yeah, it's 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 an interesting catch twenty two, really, isn't it? Do you want to risk is, having yeah. to spend more in the future? <laughs> totally, totally. Um, I think just to finish off as well, um, be, be certain about exactly what it is you're expecting from your printer. If you've got limited space, and we talk yeah. about space, uh, you can get portable printers. I, mm. I mean, these have been around for years as well. I used a portable printer about twenty twenty five years ago for college work, because mm. uh, the uh, the printer in our house was a very unreliable dot matrix. Mm. It was a school holiday, so I couldn't get into college, so I had to borrow a printer off a, a friend's parent. And this was a HP unit, um, and it was surprising. It was about the size of a, like a heavy tome. It was about this, this big, and it had a little uh, kind of a panel down the side that you would which hinge so you could twist it around to stand it up. And you mm. flip it open, stick it on the desk, plug it in. And it just it was like single feed. You give it a sheet of paper. Single feed, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. It was yeah, really good. I, I had a mate with one of those. They were really, really nice little things. And, and again, that's something that had crossed my mind is that I've got, you know, I have got my, my uh, laser printer here. But um, having seen, uh, having you know, I, I was just kind of casually, when uh, looking into this podcast, I was just kind of casually just looking over videos of them and seeing one which is admittedly quite expensive, but just uh, an incredibly quick portable desk thing that he had next to his keyboard and just went zzz and zzz. <laughs> like, yeah, oh, wow. Yeah. I could put that in my rucksack and it's smaller than my laptop. Totally. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, yeah, they're, they're great little things. So, you know, if you're not doing a lot of printing, um, you know, but you you think you're going to need a print at some point and you don't need to do any photocopying because look you've got a phone and you can do all the scanning you need to do by taking a photo of it with your phone um one of those portable printers might be exactly what you're looking for small mm. enough to put away just get out when you need it even if you need to take it to the office or whatever you can stick it in your backpack as ian mm. says uh so yeah that is um things to keep an eye on when you're buying a new printer so to recap, uh, we've revisited tips in this really useful podcast special on the topics of why your PC is slowing down, how to make a HD TV aerial from household bits and bobs, how to spot deceitful Amazon reviews, everything you need to know about building your own desk, and the best tips for buying a printer. I'm Christian Corley. My really useful podcast co-hosts are Ben Stegner, Gavin Phillips and Ian Buckley. And a big thank you to the Make Use Of management for uh, helping us to promote the podcast. We will be back in 2019 with some brand new tips and tricks. Until then, have a great Christmas and a happy holiday. <laughs>